we are live yeah okay so shall we go yes. fantastic to be addressing a gathering the sad part is i cannot see the video feeds of most of the people because we are using multiple platforms to get as many people on board as possible you just heard from neha the wonderful stories about how birds research on birds and how like long term bird monitoring which has happened in india like thank to like multiple agencies can help in conservation out here we are bringing you like wonderful stories about the cutting edge technology which people use to study and understand birds which in technical terms is called telemetry it actually means that we are using certain type of radio feed or signals to remotely monitor multiple aspects of birds we get to understand not only their movements but modern gadgets are giving us wonderful scopes of data about which you will have like fantastic stories coming from east west north and south parts of this country the wonderful part of birds or in general when we talk about birds is like not knowing borders so we also have online like few talks coming from southeast asia so dr siravit would be representing his set of research teams uh, they have been like putting a lot of transmitters on multiple raptor species from thailand and we will have like elena joining us from russian raptor research network so they have also been putting a lot of transmitters on multiple waterfowl and raptor species so i have a funny story to share with respect to like how this telemetry symposium like got organized we were requested by the main set of organizers to like come forth with ideas to unite bird monitoring teams across various institutions in the country and in that sense we have had fantastic response and even when we say that we are in the nascent stages of monitoring birds or like in terms of what has happened after the indian independence the benefit of having such kind of challenge is that we can rectify a lot of mistakes which our like teams across the world have done like there is a lot of data accessible to us in terms of how like multiple latest gadgets and traditional monitoring systems can be united and last but not the least how citizen science can be put into practice right from the word go as we expand from like one or two institutions even down to multiple state universities and non governmental organizations and various trusts who contribute to like national level bird monitoring towards the science policy applications and to conservation as such so like before we start the talk i uh, will request you to put up your questions on discord you will have the live feed of the video coming on youtube and you will have presenters helping you with your questions they will be transferred to the speakers after the talk end so please feel free to put the question i will hand it over to nikita now Nikita's audio is not audible. Okay, is it now? Is it? Yes. Right. Good morning, everyone. Ah, uh, my name is Nikita. Nikita, you're on mute. Ah, uh, so the first speaker for the day. 
is Dr. S. Balachandran. He is a renowned ornithologist and current deputy director of Bombay Natural History Society. He has been studying birds for many years now. Initially, he worked on figuring out how to prevent vulture aircraft strikes, and from there, he now seeks to understand water birds and shorebirds. The title of his talk would be Disease Surveillance and Tracking Migratory Routes of Water Birds Through Satellite Telemetry. Over on to you, Dr. Balachandran. Yeah. We can see your video feed, Bala sir. Yes, please. Shall, shall I share my screen? Please do, yeah. Good morning to everybody. Uh, Will you put it on the full screen, please? Yes, thanks. I'll be talking about that, the, how the BNHS bird migration studies are uh, interlinked with uh, disease surveillance. And uh, as you know, BNHS is the oldest organization involving in wildlife research for uh, more than 100 years. And our BNHS bird monitoring sites are uh, located and covering uh, all biogeographical zones of India, starting from this Deccan Peninsula to Himalayas. Also, we have got the Western Ghats, Eastern Ghats, Gangetic Plain, Himalayas, the Merit Zone, even in the islands. And the, uh, the multidisciplinary research involves even the applied ecology, like uh, impact of windmill and also bird assert to the aircraft. Uh, and uh, BN it is known for bird migration and is synonymous with the bird ringing studies, which was started uh, in uh, 1957. But in the uh, in the late 1960s, the we have started the in, uh, intensive bird monitoring with the funding from the World Health Organization to find out whether the birds are the carriers ha carriers of the. Uh, this arthropod virus, which was causing encephalitis in India, but the study shows the birds were the, not the carriers, but the results were very impressive to put the baseline for understanding the uh, breeding origin of several migrate species wintering in India. Uh, then we also started that uh, intensive ringing in the 1980s with the support of US Fish and Wildlife Service, followed by some state government and uh, central government, and through some CSR fundings, the BNHS is undertaking bird ringing studies all over uh, India. But over 600,000 birds have been uh, ringed, and, and the recovery says that India is well connected with at least 27 countries which are published in one Indian bird migration at least. The, uh, the recovery is also instrumental in marking the Central Asian flyway boundaries as well as how this Central Asian flyway is overlapping with the East Asian oscillation flyway in the East Coast and the uh, East African flyway in the West Coast. Similarly, after the outbreak of disease, we started the intensive ringing, like uh, when we started the uh, this mass scale, uh, large, large scale uh, satellite tracking when the outbreak happened in China, Jinjai Lake, that uh, due to the highly pathogenic avian influenza virus H5N1, where mass scale death happened in the wild birds like barred goose, reddish duck. As these birds are coming to India in large numbers to winter, 
the the FAO come forward with studying with the objective of studying the uh, movement of virus through these birds. Hence, that uh, satellite tracking started in 2008. Uh, before that, we also started by seeing the avian influenza uh, outbreak with the support of some state government funding. Which particularly we started intensive disease monitoring in uh, Chilka Lake. Um, then, okay, uh, okay. With the, uh, by deploying 108 transmitter in four states, the first phase from Tamil Nadu, that is uh, on Kundangulam and uh, Chilka Lake in Orissa, and the second phase, Assam and West Bengal. These studies were very helpful to find out that, uh, that uh, usefulness, how it is uh, very good over that uh, ringing like that because we used to get the location of the birds now and then and the major stop over site and how how long these birds are staying in this uh, site for a specific period and these are some of the uh, this one states where we did the monitoring that West Bengal man, and also later with the support from the Manipur and the Himachal government and some state, uh, state and central government we have marked about uh, is uh, about around the 27 birds and these are the breakup for the uh, transmitter displayed and the maximum birds were uh, marked from Chilka and then uh, that that is um, then Pong Dam also these two sites we have marked many birds and then I will be highlighting this some of the interesting observation as this how oh, the satellite tracking that among the species, the bargained goose was the maximum which we de uh, deployed and that satellite tracking was very successful in satellite tracking and, and uh, because it, uh, that both the uh, southern tip of India, that uh, Kodangulam and uh, Chilka Lake birds were moving on the same direction, but we could manage to find out the farthest north birds coming to the farthest south lake. That's a kind of leaf work migration and uh, Chilka birds are moving uh, less distance compared to the birds which are coming to the southern India. And again, because we are already uh, what, uh, started that neck coloring studies and the uh, uh, ringing studies, we could find out the basic of the uh, migratory routes of uh, bargained goose, but uh, still uh, the our satellite tracking studies complemented that one. And after starting the uh, satellite tracking in Pongam, where the bargained goose my, uh, occur in largest numbers in the world where that birds are uh, moving only to the uh, at a shorter distance and they are between Tibet and Kashmir from home and they are the, like a, almost like a parochial birds from movement of this uh, bargained goose track from southern India to uh, Mongolia. These are the things we found out. They have got a stop over site in at most six states as presented here and at least five uh, countries and the last destination was Mongolia the flying height was 21,400 and the maximum distance traveled was 5,600 uh, 5, kilometer non-stop flight was 1,150 around that one and also the retrap bird also uh, uh, even the transmitter marked bird we retrap that uh, after 48 days again 700 gram and the usage of various uh, but various kind of habitats, particularly uh, this barred uh, goose, preferring the grassland and the inland wetlands, also using salpen as a stop over site and particles, wheat fields, these things. We we'll come to know through these satellite tracking studies. Okay, then before that program studies, we could not, we, we could know, know that the birds are mostly coming from China and uh, Mongolia and Tibet, but here, the uh, Barreto Goose, the largest population is only from a parochial region. This kind of information also we generated that through that tracking. The other interesting species is the uh, radicial duck. And here, these radicial ducks were marked from four sites, one from Pongdam, then Chilka, Azam, and Manipur. And uh, the, all these sites receive bird from different geographic area. I, which was uh, shown in the slide like that, and particularly the Himachal 
that Pongdam mark birds. Uh, Pongdam uh, mark birds. Uh, movement was very interesting, though the nesting site was just 500 to 600 uh, kilometer between the wintering and the breeding site, but it, it took a circuitous route of another 2000 kilometer to reach that area and using the same migratory route to reach the wintering site in the subsequent years. It is quite interesting why they are taking this kind of routes. And also Manipur birds actually moved from China to Mongolia. Uh, that one and this uh, Chilka birds moved only up to Tibet. And uh, then we got a uh, funding from the uh, Ministry of Environment to track the uh, flamingo. Flamingo, we have got already recoveries from uh, uh, Kazakhstan and Iran to uh, southern India, but the studies uh, shows they were moving within India only and within South India between Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh, and regularly they are migrating uh, to northern Sri Lanka during the summer, like three years. This, this is also successfully tracked as transmitters last for more than three years. And we predicted that there could be a uh, local population in uh, southern India which can migrate within uh, southern India also. But this is a import how to how this uh, pintail study shows how they are using different habitat in their annual cycle. We are ringing from the market in Kanyakumari using Arizona like in Andhra Pradesh and also Afghanistan, the ice covered mountain, and finally to go to the Arctic. So this this is a this is a way the satellite uh, transmitter study can help to identify the uh, the, this one, different habitats used during their uh, migratory journey. And uh, uh, already told how BNHS is what associated with the uh, disease monitoring and the Chilka monitoring studies. That time we have got about 2000 bird death, but we it was suspected maybe uh, H5N1, but it was not, uh, not due to H5N1. We have recorded all the uh, symptoms of the disease with the duck flake and the avian botrytum, and uh, these are some of the symptoms we observed. But the symptoms are multi disease symptom, and this is a statistics for how many birds we have uh, collected or dead or disease, and uh, and send the sample to some the veterinary lab, and uh, this uh, and also these are the some of the statistics for the. As uh, avian influenza sample collected and sent to the high security animal disease laboratory where they are confirmed it is not due to the uh, avian influenza because this is a slide showing that how our uh, disease monitoring uh, what uh, spread over the all over India and then the, the death finally we confirmed the death happened in India due to disease or not due to H5N1 and mostly due to the for the veterinarians and uh, a wildlife stop to how to conduct the disease surveillance in wild birds and uh, uh, then <clears throat> and uh, the training was taken under the global avian influenza uh, network and surveillance and uh, but some of the strategic in, uh, information which I have already mentioned and uh, that uh, leaf frog migration they, there is a uh, local population which is moving within southern India for the greater Flamingo, this kind of satellite information which uh, uh, recorded through the satellite tracking studies and it is some way it is what uh, better. Okay. okay, with that one I stop. stop Hello? Lekita, your audio is not up. Yes, we can hear Dr. Bala. Lekita, you, we can't hear you. But, but you couldn't hear properly during the entire presentation. We could hear, we could hear. Ah, okay. But any question I can... Yes. 
Nikita will ask questions. Nikita, we still can't hear you. Yes, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, so we'll move on to the question and answer session. Um, the first question is from Anuprita. Are there changes in migratory routes of birds due to climate change? Like the Siberian cranes have stopped migrating to India since 2002 or so. Mm, yeah, you know, with our experience, not through the satellite tracking, but with our experience in what handling so many birds per ringing, many, many species which are occurring in the water, particularly in the East Asian Australian Playway, which is using China as the stop -over, common stopover sites for both the flyways, but they are decreasing in the play, what East Asian Australian Playway and they are uh, what migrating to India and their range extension is gone up to the uh, what uh, uh, this uh, Gulf countries also that one even West Coast uh, and even West to the Gulf countries also that that is a, a typical example for how the migratory patterns are changing. Hello. All right. Ah. I'm audible. The answer was clear to them. Thank Hello? you so much, Dr. Balachandran. Uh, since we are, yes, you. Thank you so much, Dr. Balachandran. I think Nikita's um, network has some problem. Dr. Bala, your answer was very clear. We could all hear you very clearly. Okay, uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Nikita, are you still there? Sorry about the technical problem. Please bear with us for two minutes. Right. Um, Dr. Bala, there are a few more questions on Discord for you. Um, maybe you can log into Discord and try to see if you can answer some of those questions in a text-based discussion on Discord. And um, we can continue this conversation there. Due to lack of time, uh, we will have to move on to the next session. Until Nikita and Nishant are back uh, online, we will um, start with our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is um, Gita Ramaswamy, and she will be uh, talking to us about invasive plant management insights from bird telemetry. Um, so if we can play Gita's video now. Hi, everyone. My name is Gita, and I'm here today to present insights from bird telemetry study that we did in an applied ecology project which was uh, invasive plant management. Uh, most of you may know that invasive plants are plants that actually evolved in a different uh, geographic range, and they were introduced to new ranges by humans intentionally or accidentally. And uh, these species have now proliferated beyond their region of introduction and started harming uh, indigenous species over there. All the plants that you see on this slide are invasive in India. And the last plant here is Lantana camera, the species that I will be talking about during this talk. Uh, Lantana has a, a very old history in India. It was introduced more than 200 years ago to India and was recognized very rapidly as a problem plant across forests of India. Uh, this plant, although in its entire introduced range across the world, has multiple methods of control, including chemical, biological, and mechanical means, still continues to be a problem plant. And one reason for this could be that we are not considering all the ecological factors that go into making an invasive plant invasive. For instance, when we are thinking of tackling an invasive species, we always imagine it as an invasion front 
where there are plants which are uh, moving along a front either through vegetative or through uh, vegetative means or through seeds however in long established species with a history of more many decades of establishment the way the uh, invasion progresses is very different uh, the source plants are present all over the landscape and we cannot treat it as a expanding front uh, which is why many of these methods the chemical biological and the mechanical methods even though they are effective in removing individual plants are not very effective in curtailing uh, invasion at the larger scale not only this well established species also have the opportunity to form uh, associations with generalist mutualists uh, such as pollinators and uh, dispersers that can uh, adapt to a wide variety of uh, nutritional sources uh, lantana for example is very attractive to uh, pollinators such as butterflies and to dispersers such as bulbuls which ensure that there is lots of seeds set lots of fruit produced and lots of seeds dispersed as well keeping this background in mind we wanted to know whether dispersal by generalist avian frugivores actually affects invasive plant management uh, can we expect generalist avian frugivores to bring back uh, plants from uh, uh, source plants back into uh, managed areas to do this we went to rajaji national park which is in the state of uttarakhand this is a tropical seasonal forest and many parts of the forest are invaded by lantana Uh, it finds a prime place in the uh, forest management strategy and it is uh, regularly removed from these low lying seasonally flooded grasslands called chords through a particular method called the cut root stock method wherein the plant is damaged just before the, just under the soil surface uh, preventing it from sprouting back uh, at the time of this study um, uh, patches between 3 and 60 hectares in the different ranges of the forest were cleared uh, before this study was started uh, so to understand whether lantana was recolonizing managed areas we uh, did a few quick uh, surveys across the forest firstly we wanted to see if lantana is regenerating in managed areas and for this we went to the managed chords where we put uh, quadrats and sampled within these quadrats the abundance and height of uh, regenerating individuals not surprisingly we found that even in managed areas up to 29 individuals were regenerating in every 100 square meter area 72% of this regeneration was from re-sprouting which means that the cut root stock method had not uh, actually worked and that the re-sprouting meristem was still active and uh, an old root stock was producing new uh, small individuals vegetatively Uh, the other source of regeneration was through seedlings which on average were shorter than sprouts the source of this seedlings uh, could be two uh, one could be the soil seed bank from which the seedlings were arising or the uh, seedlings could have come from seeds that were dispersed from source plants outside of managed areas now to find out how far the average source plant was from the managed areas we did two things firstly we sampled across the forest to understand the overall density of lantana uh, through transect sampling and we found that more than 1300 stems were present per hectare in the rajaji national park the second thing we did was to find out how far the centers of managed areas were from the nearest source plant and this was again uh, done using transects and we found that the median distance to the nearest source plant in most of the managed chords is 20 point Uh, 6 meters so what we concluded from this is that lantern is actually very widespread in the forest and source plants are rather close to managed areas beyond this how were seeds reaching into the managed areas uh, this was the next question to answer we decided to focus on two generalist avian frugivores that are known to associate with lantana in other types of uh, dry forests in india uh, tree watches were done and uh, it was found that uh, the red vented bulbul and the red whiskered bulbul are two species that spend an inordinate amount of time foraging on lantana bushes and they were also uh, consuming lots and lots of fruits and therefore likely to be very effective dispersers of the plant now to understand how bulbuls were able to disperse how far bulbuls were dispersing seeds from source or parent plants into managed areas we uh, did bird telemetry 
and we combine that information with gut passage time for lantana uh, to understand this better so the first step was to actually uh, capture the birds and we were able to capture three bulbuls we were able to attach uh, uh, you know uh, telemetry tags on them and track them through radio telemetry uh, and this gave us movement data for three uh, individual bulbuls we then combined this with gut passage time for lantana seeds which is we fed uh, bulbuls with lantana fruits and we saw the amount of time that it took for them to void the seeds and this was known as the gut passage time we then combined uh, these two types of information in an iterative framework where we knew the uh, movement of uh, the birds in a given amount of time we knew how much time it took for the bird to swallow and void a seed so we could then figure out how much a bird displaced during this time of the gut passage time we did this for the total number of seeds that were used in our gut passage uh, trials gut passage time trials and we did it over a number of iterations over 1000 times and this gave us a frequency distribution of dispersal distances so basically for a, a unit time moved by the bird how far could a dispersed seed reach from the parent plant and this is the results that we got you can see uh, from this uh, graph that most of the uh, seeds that were consumed by bulbuls actually landed very close to the parent plants between 0 and 50 meters from the parent plants and there were extremely few uh, seeds that reached a much further distance of up to 700 meters now this is not surprising because from other studies elsewhere we know that actually bulbuls disperse seeds very close to the parent plant so this uh, red block over here gives the range of other studies that have reported the same type of dispersal ranges now if we were to look at this in the context of how far the centers of managed areas in rajaji are from source plants then we find that the median distance of 20.6 meters is bang in the middle of this uh, range of distances so basically what we concluded is that uh, lots of managed or uh, most of the managed areas in rajaji were in fact in the path of the distance that uh, dispersers can easily uh, eat and void seeds of lantana into so as long as there were source plants near managed areas that were within the median dispersal range by bulbuls we can expect to keep getting uh, uh, regeneration through seeds in managed areas so can we apply then this knowledge to uh, devise better management strategies for lantana given that it's a long established widespread species associating with generalist fruit growers that can disperse uh, seeds right back into managed areas so here is our suggestion for uh, protected areas first is to prioritize the area within the protected area where we need to exclude lantana completely now the entire protected area might be too large to achieve this so it would be good to prioritize areas within the protected area where we just cannot do with any lantana Uh, we then need to continue controlling bounds over many many years till such time that uh, source plants are very far from the centers of managed area and this can be achieved by let's say in the first bout clearing out lantana from the managed area of interest in the next bout clearing out more area around the previously cleared area and in the next bout clearing even more area around the uh, earlier managed area Uh, such that there are these layers of uh, management that are happening and how do we determine this extra area that is uh, that we have to clear around the earlier managed area is that this should be at least the median distance that uh, birds can disperse seeds from parent plants or source plants back into managed areas so the aim here is to make the source plants as far away as po possible from the uh, managed areas and this was our suggestion to the forest department uh, in uh, managing um, lantana going hence forth and these are the insights that we got from bird telemetry and how they disperse lantana into managed areas so thank you this project was done at the indian institute of science with the support of csiro australia and dst india thanks i'll take questions
for me. Uh, now moving on to the question answer round. Uh, we have one question from Rishma. Landana are a host to a variety of butterflies. So if we remove lantana, how will it affect the butterflies? Would it pose a threat to them? Yeah, this is another problem with long established invasive species because they form this association with the mutualists like uh, pollinators and dispersers. When we manage the plant now, we have to take care that these new associations that are formed, they don't uh, you know, harm the uh, uh, species of interest in a bad way. So some of the suggestions that others uh, people have made is that we substitute uh, lantana with uh, other kinds of native plants that provide the same kind of service uh, that lantana provides. So if you are removing uh, lantana from a place which is uh, which is producing lots of small fruits that bulbuls can eat, then we replace that with another native local species that can uh, uh, take over that role that uh, lantana was doing. So uh, we need to then actively manage, we need to actively uh, restore the kind of uh, food sources that are there for pollinators and dispersers. Uh, not just remove, but also add these other species. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Geeta. Uh, our next question is by Ankita. Apart from the rootstock removal method, what method do you recommend to clear out the lantana in your recommended areas? Uh, so, I mean, uh, many methods are effective. The cut rootstock method is really effective because it damages the vegetative meristem. And uh, that would be a very good way to uh, remove lantana uh, with minimal physical disturbance to the soil and uh, the habitat in general. You could also try uprooting lantana where possible. It may be uh, completely doable in urban areas or in um, agricultural areas, but this may not always be possible in uh, protected areas or forests. So there it might be a better strategy to use the cut rootstock method. All these both methods are good for controlling individual, I mean, for damaging individual lantana plants. Yeah. All right. And the last question is, uh, are there any other birds that can be, that can act as seed dispersers for lantana? Yes, actually during our tree, so we uh, estimated who was eating lantana by doing tree watches, which is we uh, looked at a particular focal bush for some amount of time. And so what all was coming to the bush and eating uh, the fruits. So apart from bulbuls, we also got uh, white eyes, uh, we also had an instance of a grey hornbill coming and eating the fruits. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, evidence from uh, scats of mammals that, uh, you know, civets uh, could also be dispersing uh, lantana. So there are multiple other uh, frugivores who are uh, also dispersing lantana apart from bulbuls. Uh, but bulbuls spend a lot of time uh, foraging at these bushes, much more than these other frugivores, at least from our tree watches. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ramaswamy. Uh, you. The remaining questions would be answered on Discord. And uh, now we can move on to our next presenter, Dr. Soumya Prasad. Dr. Soumya Prasad is a tropical ecologist at the Nature Science Initiative, and her research interests lie in studying seed dispersal and its consequences for maintenance of ecosystems and forest management. Alongside that, she is also studying the impacts of garbage on human and animal health and ecology. And the title of her talk oh, for today oh, oh, would, be oh, on, oh, would be on Asian hornbills and their implications in seed dispersal. On to you, please, Dr. Prasad. Am I audible? Yes, yes, we can hear you. And uh, is the screen visible? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is a, a slightly dated talk from data we collected uh, some years ago. Okay. And uh, this comes from uh, our work with uh, 
Projua communities in Rajaji National Park. Okay. Some of you here worked on this team. Okay. And um, it's, uh, it's a very simple talk because we track moments of just three adult convents okay, during uh, the course of the work. Okay. And uh, we were trying to characterize those personal kernels for the entire plant community. So we characterize them into functional groups and um, we're trying to get uh, movement data as well as uh, fruit removal and uh, dispersal distance estimates for um, a whole range of plant species found here in the Himalayan foothills. Okay. The concern being that uh, as it gets warmer in the, I mean, as things warm up, these species would need to migrate to cooler habitats um, upslope in the mountains. And, uh, but the fact that um, they could be dispersal limited by um, the loss of frugivores um, or the loss of habitat, okay, or a com combination of both can, could affect their um, plant responses to climate change. Okay, this was uh, our main objective, okay. Uh, while we look at uh, the, uh, I mean, when we look at an entire plant community as such, okay, the largest seeds um, in most uh, first habitats are dispersed by the largest frugivores. Okay, that's because there's a concise um, constraint on the seeds that can be small, swallowed by smaller frugivores. Okay, thus mammalian frugivores uh, that we have in our landscape, uh, the elephant and the deer disperse the largest seeds we have in these um, tropical or subtropical uh, dry forest landscapes we have around here, okay? And uh, among the avian frugivores, the hornbills and barbets disperse um, the largest seeds we have here, okay? Uh, we don't have very, very large seeds in this forest, which um, like you find in um, wetter forests, which are dispersed by hornbills, okay? The largest seed which is dispersed by humbles here is around uh, 9 mm. Okay. So um, the, uh, the humbles, of course, I mean, they are the speakers here. Uh, they represent um, a very important um, component of uh, tropical ecosystems in both Asia and Africa. Okay. Uh, they disperse somewhere between around 30% of the plant community, 20 to 30% of the plant community in different sites. Okay. Uh, in other sites, seeds as large as 50 mm are documented to be dispersed by hornbills. Okay. But hornbills vary tremendously. Within the group, there is a huge range of body sizes, okay, from birds over three kilos to lesser than half a kilo. Okay. Also, they differ quite a bit in their diet. Okay. There are some species that eat more insects and um, hunt. <coughs> more often <coughs> there are others that um, feed uh, predominantly on figs okay some um, do display habitat specialization okay they also differ in their social structuring okay within uh, the the group you will find species that are more uh, like that, that tend to live in groups versus those that um, are more uh, structured, the family structures uh, are smaller, okay. This variation leads to differences in how hornbills move and where seeds land, okay. And um, the, uh, the hornbill uh, breeding behavior that the uh, female is encased in a nest and the male provides um, uh, nourishment through a period of uh, two to three months can uh, I mean, does influence um, their dispersal uh, consequences. Okay, and uh, breeding overlaps often with periods of high fruit availability, especially the non-fig fruit in um, across the seasonal tropics. Okay, several hornbills expand home range in the non-breeding season, and they're foraging on. Um, a lot of figs during the non-breeding season. Okay, um, we um, this has been pro proposed by Margaret Kennard and Tim O'Brien that uh, hornbills possibly can be classified into these two strategies in terms of their foraging and breeding. 
okay a large bird strategy not necessarily with respect to body size but with respect to its behavior where its other uh, species is more nomadic outside of the breeding season um has very long daily displacements of 30 or more kilometers they're not territorial move in large groups okay and predominantly feed on pigs the great hornbill um, that we find here in india uh, could fit into this uh, Uh, description okay a small bird strategy has been described for other hornbills which are more territorial this is outside of the breeding season okay they're more territorial they make efforts to defend um for aging areas okay they have short daily movements and high percentage of animal uh, matter and uh, lipid rich fruits in their diet okay Uh, though it's not really proven we suspect that the oriental pied hornbill which we worked on fits into uh, the small bird strategy okay this um is um, thanks to sataj kuman we have this uh, amazing illustration of uh, the hornbills of um, the himalayan foothills uh, where we work uh, oriental pied hornbill great hornbill and the uh, indian grey hornbill okay uh, of these three the indian grey is the most common Okay, and the great hornbill is um, like relatively uncommon in our landscape. Okay, and um, the oriental pied is now uh, surprisingly expanding into uh, urban areas here in this landscape. It's become very very common in urban Dehradun since two thousand fourteen. Okay, it was not not documented at all in urban Dehradun uh, from hundred years of birding records. We we don't have records before twenty years. I mean twenty years prior to now, we don't have records before two thousand two. Okay, um, so uh, I mean it's a very uh, the oriental pied hornbill um, is um, it's a very fascinating bird. It's like it's around one point two kilos. It's not as small as your grey hornbill. Okay, it's somewhere between eight hundred to one point two kilos. It has a, a very diverse diet. Okay, it eats a whole range of uh, feeds on a whole range of fruit species besides figs. Okay, and um, we suspect from what we observe uh, both at shooting trees and the moment data that we have that it's it's it is territorial. Okay, we track two females and one male in spring. Okay, and uh, this is. Uh, a month before a month month and a half before they nest in our uh, study site okay and the tags were fitted um, using a harness and um, in such a way that they could fall off easily okay so we did lose a couple of transmitters in this process okay we um, we track birds for a maximum of 14 days okay and uh, the tags were programmed to give us locations every 3 minutes uh the reason being that we wanted to uh get an estimation of the dispersal kernel okay for which we need very fine scale movement data and um the the frequency was decided based on the uh, gut retention times uh, in hornbills and um the minimum gut retention times in hornbills okay so uh, this is uh, the data we have okay the the maximum displacement in 3 minutes was uh, 1.3 kilometers and the mean displacement was around 11 meters okay this is um this is the typical daily movement patterns that we found uh, the birds would fly from their roost to the feeding areas a cluster of putranjiva roxbagai trees along the ganges river okay and um the um uh we mapped the putranjiva as well as uh, fruiting putranjiva as well as ficus species which hornbills were feeding on at this this narrow period that we were tracking them for a month okay and uh, all of that was in a tight cluster okay along the river bank okay uh, which you see these um, the green uh, dots represent the putranjiva trees and the blue are the ficus and um the hornbill mo uh, movement intensity use intensity is overlaps with the fruiting trees okay we combined uh, movement patterns of hornbills with uh, gut passage data that was shared to, uh, with us by uh, ushma shukla and um, rohit nani wadeka okay from what they did in the northeast okay using a different bunch of uh, plants than what we've been studying 
but nevertheless it's the only data that was available for uh, the Orient Pride Hornbill and um, we uh, picked up random locations in their uh, daily uh, displacements uh, we, starting from um, I mean when they uh, arrive at fruiting trees to see uh, how far seeds are dispersed okay so um, we're getting a mean of around 120 meters okay and um, and it appears that 50 percent of the seeds uh, may be dispersed within 27 meters okay that's the median okay so it's um when you compare this with the kind of uh, dispersal kernels that you get from say uh, Rohit's data in the Northeast, this looks quite different, okay? So uh, this is just three birds, but it's very uh, insightful. And this is three birds before uh, they get, went into nesting, okay? So um, the seed shadows uh, were projected and um, overlapping of course with uh, the birds movement ranges, which is quite small. Okay, in the chilla uh, habitat. Okay, um, sorry about this slightly um, mixed up slide. Okay, and also a bit dated. So if you, uh, if we look at the oriental pine and the hornbills in this study, okay, the mean and the median dispersal distances are much lesser than, as I mentioned, Rohit's uh, other work, as well as uh, earlier work from Africa. Okay. I would like to thank all my collaborators and friends who uh, who really helped uh, run this program for four years in Rajaji. Okay, Preeti and uh, Gita are here. Okay, as well as uh, David Westcott, um, a collaborator from Australia. Okay, if there are any questions? I'm happy to take them now. Okay. Hi, Soumya. Hi. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Fantastic to see you. Mm, nice. We are still waiting for certain questions which people are typing. So meanwhile, I will just nudge one set of discussion which will probably benefit everybody. So your talk, apart from giving the statistics about the wonderful work you guys have done, did nudge a lot about bird territoriality, which is still a big conundrum. Like I have like read through like multiple literature, but we still interpret telemetry of birds pretty much similar to mammals where their whole like life history traits, which push them to behave in a certain way differs from birds totally. So would you touch upon these points if you have had similar doubts? Yeah, it's a fascinating uh, question, Nishant. Okay. When we look at even like uh, Gita worked on bulbul movements in the same habitat in Chile and that was published. Okay. So uh, we found that bulbuls were having larger daily displacements than the hornbills we were tracking around the same time. Okay. And bulbuls move in a very resource dependent manner. They are they're tracking resources that are, you know, spread over very large uh, spatial scales. And, um, and that's why they're so uh, closely associated with lantana, okay. They, um, it's, it's uh, really fascinating. And it's a question that I wanted to model uh, because uh, hornbills, um, it's, it's very interesting when you watch them at fruiting trees, especially oriented by it, okay. They'll chase away other birds and it's, they're guarding a particular resource and they tend to guard that resource, okay. So it's, um, uh, it's it's not like they're even getting up and flying off to another tree and coming back. Uh, but a pair of birds arrives and they spend a, most of the day in a particular tree, okay, just hovering in and out of the tree, okay, for for the Oriental pied hornbill, not necessarily for other species, okay. But we have data from just a very short window in March, okay. This was pre-breeding. What would be required is data across um, a longer stretch of the non-breeding season, okay, and um, and also like um, a comparison with uh, the other smaller hornbill species we have here, the Indian grey, okay, which I don't know. I'm I'm a bit confused about the Indian grey, okay. So we'll 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 only answer if we have more data. Directly, I've touched upon two more questions which popped on our screens. So people quickly want your opinions about sudden increase in the number of oriental pied. So you sort of hinted that they tend to chase away. So 
Will you say something about that? And they want to know if Indian hornbills fall into which category, large bird strategy or small bird strategy? I, I didn't get the first question. Was my question audible to you, Samia? No, I, I didn't hear, understand the first half of the question about uh, the first question. Okay, let me get to that large bird strategy and small bird strategy. We have birds who could fall into both the categories. Okay, um, the great hornbill that we have at our side fits the typical large bird strategy. So do the bulbuls we have at our study site. Okay, they behave more like large birds, though by body size they are smaller. Okay. Um, when it comes to the oriental pied hornbill, and I also suspect the Indian gray hornbill, they're following the small bird strategy. They're more territorial outside of the breeding season, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're guarding resources. Not, the territoriality is, um, is very interesting. It's not being studied. Uh, same with barbets. We see the same thing going on with barbets again, okay? It's a very interesting group that's very, very, very poorly studied across Asia. Uh, be it in terms of the breeding behavior, which is, you know, a chorus lacking, or in terms of uh, the way they guard resources outside of the breeding uh, period. Okay, so it's um, it's a question that's out there, and I hope uh, more students will look at this in the coming years. Okay. It's sad that you are caught up towards the later part of the session in the afternoon, somewhere because yeah. this has hinted us like this is what I was expecting that certain talks would nudge us into directions which can be explored by all of us as community because it's high time that we start probing questions as a unit as well. Like we will continue to like check individual species and various length and breadths of the continent rather because we are integrated here as a continent. We have few speakers from outside India as well. So like when we discuss it next time, I guess like we should have like certain strategy to discuss in the panel discussion would be placed beforehand and we will have like better discussion. We'll touch upon these points. We have more questions which we'll shoot to you about like nest site fidelity and all, but fantastic talk. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. Uh, our next speaker for today is Dr. Neeraj Mahar. He has recently completed his doctorate from the Wildlife Institute of India. His research interests have revolved around the distribution and conservation of mountain ungulates, canids, and their adaptations to anthropogenic changes and AV fauna of the Trans-Himalayan region. The title of his talk is Movement Patterns and Conservation Issues of Breeding Waterbirds in Ladakh and the Trans-Himalayan region. On to you, Dr. Neeraj. Hi everyone, I am Neeraj from Wildlife Institute of India and presently I'm working as a research associate at the Institute. And today I'll be talking about uh, bird monitoring in Ladakh using some tools and techniques, including radio telemetry and field observations. I will also discuss some conservation issues of this landscape. For that, I have divided my presentation in two parts and first part deals with the movement pattern. As we know that the Central Asian flyway is a crucial flyway for different migratory birds. And it is also important in terms of disease outbreaks. Similarly, there are study on black nut cranes, mostly in China. As you can see that the green polygons denote their breeding range and the red polygons show their wintering range. And different lines denote different species, uh, sorry, different studies in this landscape. And mostly you can see the birds are coming from Central Asia to the lower valleys of uh, Ningxi and Xingdu and Bhutan and Arunachal. In terms of uh, barred goose, several studies have been conducted in different Central Asian countries and Indian subcontinent. One of the studies by Tekkawa et al., which come from leaf flock migration pattern in barred goose, which has been seen in the passerines in Americas. So based on such a vast previous literature 
and fascination with uh, migration pattern. Wildlife Institute of India and Department of Wildlife Protection came up with a project on movement pattern of breeding water birds like black net cranes and barred geese in Ladakh. The main objective of this study was to examine movement pattern of black net crane and barred goose in Ladakh and also to assess population status and breeding productivity of black net crane in Changthang. As we know that Ladakh is a trans Himalayan area and mostly it remains frozen for four to five months. In this picture, you can see it is uh, Somururi Lake, which is situated in Changthang Plateau. And it is also a breeding site of uh, uh, different water birds. Up to 15 breeding water birds uh, come to breed in Ladakh, including black nut crane and barred goose. Uh, this area also has different type of rodents and legomorphs including bull, pikas, and mammoth. Woolly wolf is the top predator of this landscape. Coming to our study species, which is black net crane, it is known as Chatuntun Karmo in local language, and it is distributed in three countries, mostly in China, India, and Bhutan. And there are some vagrant records from Nepal as well. Globally, their population is less than 10,000 individuals, and recently it has been declared as state bird of Ladakh. Recently, it has also downgraded as near threatened species, which we will discuss later. So to study their migration pattern, uh, we chose Changthang Plateau, where they usually come for uh, breeding during summer season. Changthang Wildlife Sanctuary is uh, comprised of 4,000 square kilometer area, and most of the study sites were about above the sea level of 4,000 meter. And we studied 25 wetlands in this region. Being a trans Himalayan and uh, cold arid region, it receives very uh, less rainfall, and temperature varies from plus 30 to minus 40 during summer and winter, respectively. There are different type of wetlands, including river and wetlands, which are mostly formed by Indus and its tributaries, like strand wetland, like the Pangong Lake, and also the marshes, which are known as palestrine wetland. And these are the crucial habitats for black net cranes. Coming to the capturing part and analysis, so to study migration pattern, uh, we did uh, deploy new straps and we used backpack method to deploy transmitter on the back of birds. The capture procedure was conducted by bird trappers from BNHS and we used Argos PTT transmitter, which was uh, less than 5% of the total weight of bird. The PTT transmitter emits uh, different type of location classes in which location class 3 is considered as the most accurate class with the error of 150 meter, while zero class location gives location with the error of 1000 meters. And it also gives a location class of ABZ, which we didn't use for our analysis part. We only use from three to zero classes. For home range estimation, we used MCP and kernel methods and 50% MCP and kernel was considered as core area used by different water birds and 95% MCP and kernel was used as a total active activity area of birds. We used our software and Ad Habitat HR package was used with some other supporting packages. These are the detail of uh, captured individuals of black nut crane and barred red goose, where we tagged two black nut cranes and two barred red goose with PTTs. And two barred red goose were uh, fitted with the neck collar band with a unique number on that. These are the results of uh, telemetry exercise of black nut crane, where you can see in the first figure, it was captured in Rongo wetland, which is a breeding site of uh, black nut crane. And the last location was received after two and a half months from Lal Pahadi area. And during this tenure, the burst bird mostly used in and around areas of Rongo and Lal Pahadi. And occasionally it uh, went uh, on the eastern side of sanctuary near uh, China border. For another individual, we track this individual near Chushul and we continuously received data for two months. And we found this bird using mostly the areas of Pangong and Chushul, especially the marsh habitats. We received different uh, type of data and total fixes were received for first individual about 131 and for second individual it was 139. The core area was uh, calculated as 0.33 and 0.19 square kilometer for both individual and per day movement was recorded as about three to four kilometer 
per day and total movement was recorded from 272 to 39 km for barred goose uh, for first individual as you can see the it migrated from its initial position towards the himachal border but sadly after few months uh, after two and a half months uh, we didn't get any further location from this uh, individual uh, for second individual we just get data for one month and then it defunct the total movement for first individual was about 1000 km and for second it was 360 km well where uh, the per day movement was about uh, 10 to 11 km we also fitted neck bands in two individuals of uh, barreted goose which we later recited in gharana wetland during winter season another uh, neck band barreted geese which was uh, tagged by bnhs in pong dam we cited this individual in somruri lake with some chicks and it was uh, on about uh, the month of june or july so this way we confirm that uh, we has a resident population or individuals of barreted goose in india to summarize my result uh, both cranes uh, were tracked till at the end of november 2013 for just two and a, and a half month and we couldn't prove uh, either these birds are migratory or not the kernel core home range for the black nut crane was akin to the uh, studies in china which was less than 0.50 square kilometer the total movement uh, of black nut crane was recorded from 1000 to 3000 meter so 2000 meter uh, kilometers in uh, china during their annual migration whereas in our study we just recorded 2 to 300 kilometers movement in terms of barreted goose we confirmed the resident population or individuals uh, in ladakh which we did by the confirming reciting of neck band collared birds in pong dam and kharana and barreted geese showed a leaf frog migration just like uh, they they visited their nearest wintering site from ladakh coming to the second part of my presentation which was population status and breeding performance of black nut crane uh, presently if we'll talk about the different aspect in ladakh then the tourism and the defense installations presence of uh, uh, defense personnel and dogs is continuously increasing in this landscape and also the number of black nut cranes are also increasing over the years and different studies have highlighted these issues over the years to study the population and breeding success of black nut crane uh, i visited different wetlands within the interval of 15 days between may to october however few individuals arrive early in april or march adult sub adult and juvenile category was divided to count water birds uh, especially black nut crane and these observations were made from 275 fixed points different 25 wetlands and these were the point count uh, sorry the total count method we used to uh, count birds for reproductive parameters uh, we uh, we collected information on nest survival daily survival rate hatching success breeding success and recruitment rate uh, we didn't find any significant difference in the population between two years and it varies somewhere 44 to 88 individuals which is almost remain same during two years of sampling these are the results of breeding productivity of black nut crane 77 percent nests were found in marsh habitats followed by the lakes in 2016 19 nests were recorded and overall 14 hatchings were recorded in later phase and eventually 11 chicks survived breeding success for 2016 was 29% and recruitment was 16 and exporter exposure days was 695 for 2016 while nest survival rate was 21% in 2017 there was a slightly high number of nests as 21 we recorded and then hatchings were 18 and 14 chicks survived eventually during 2017 and hatching success was about 43% while breeding success was 33% exposure days were 90 uh, 19 and sorry 944 because uh, few uh, pairs tried again for breeding and they successfully raised their chicks in second attempt so that's why the exposure days were increased in 2017 
in Nestle, but the Nestle survival rate was less than 2016. We also tried to find out the causes of breeding failures. And we confirmed that 30 to 40 percent of the uh, breeding failure was attributed to dogs because they were predating on chicks and eggs. And few, like like the seven to 14 percent, were attributed to floods, especially due to melting of glacier water and snowpack ice. We also did some ad, ad libitum samplings for uh, observations of different type of species. Legume of rodentia and water birds were vulnerable to predation and disturbance in Ladakh. While large group of dogs chased canids like the wolf and equids like the kiang in this landscape on few occasions. So this way, dogs are posing threats to some of the endangered species of this landscape. Initially in 1919, uh, three individuals of crane and one breeding pair was recorded by the Ludlo. However, 2014 study uh, came up with 120 individuals, but less breeding pairs than present study. Uh, similar to our uh, study, breeding success was reported about 33% in China, and present study confirmed 30 to 40% predation of chicks and eggs by dogs. And increasing dog population is posing threat to the wildlife in this landscape, and also the tourism activities also posing some level of threats to the habitat and the breeding species. In 2000. IUCN committee did decided to downgrade IUCN status of uh, black nut crane to least concern. But after rebuttal from Indian side, they decided to keep it as a near threatened species. And for that, uh, we used our findings and our study. We tried to pursue them to not downgrade the status of black nut crane. And many NGOs and individuals supported this campaign uh, on their online platform and they strongly uh, defended the status of uh, uh, black net crane in India. So there were some limitations in our study which I would like to highlight. First of all, the sample size because we had a very less sample size so we could not ascertain anything substantial from our study. And another issue which remained very challenging for us was the transmitter performance. Most of these uh, transmitters were active for just maximum for two or three months. So that also remained a limitation for us. With this, I would like to thank my funding agency, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Department of Wildlife Protection. Uh, I would like to thank Nishant for uh, providing this platform. With this, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Maher. That was quite interesting. And I guess it has opened a Pandora box of interest shifting from migratory birds to resident birds and comparisons. But somewhere our listeners are confused about the term fixes. So I will quickly solve them for us before we move on to the question. So fixes actually mean something like what you do with your mobile. So you send landmark or your GPS location to somebody. In case of monitoring of birds using telemetry, this is just an automated process that after certain seconds or minutes, a GPS fix is acquired utilizing the satellite transmitter uh, satellite communication and it is communicated to us using various ways which we can discuss towards afternoon so nishand has an interesting question for you dr maher that what is the procedure for kind of a citizen participation not everybody can go into like proper research but if they locate a bird with a transmitter or if they can like photograph it what is the procedure do you have a system in place for citizen science uh -huh. Uh, thank you, Nishant, for this question. Actually, uh, over the years, uh, means when I was working there, at the time there was no awareness as such, and citizen science was also evolving that time. But now, I guess there are more birders are going in Ladakh, and and the locals are also active. There are small groups uh, have been formed by locals to monitor wildlife and birds. So yeah, uh, now we can use that uh, as a tool to to observe wildlife and to. Um, means work as a watchdog for 
the wildlife and as as i mentioned i guess uh, in my presentation that uh, we also took uh, uh, observations of local pastoralists which were uh, residing around the nesting sites uh, especially about the fate of a nest so because they were residing very close to the nest so they could tell us okay what was the actual reason for the uh, breeding failure of uh, individuals and and it it, it happened uh, on many occasions where we utilize their own observation so this way citizen science is playing now a uh, active role in ladakh thank you thanks nishant and friends we are very happy to have this kind of encouraging response from you so our like lead organizers based at ncf they run a fantastic citizen science program and we will surely get in like connection with multiple organizations and we might try and develop something where like multiple citizens can come up and it should not be like based on institutions we have more like questions coming up but dr maher would take them when he is free from the day's talk so thanks dr maher that was fantastic and good for taking us from north east to trans himalayas over to niketa thank you dr maher uh, our next speaker for the day is dr rohit nani vadekar he completed his masters in wildlife sciences at the wildlife institute of india dehradun and his phd from the nature conservation fund and manipal university he is currently a scientist at ncf and is interested in frugivory seed dispersal and conservation of tropical forests and its inhabitants The title of his talk is Understanding Ecology and the Ecological Role of Hornbills Using Telemetry. On to you, Dr. Nandanikar. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be presenting our research based on the telemetry data on hornbills. At the onset, I would like to sincerely thank the organizers for inviting me for this very interesting mini symposium. Hornbills are fascinating birds. They are among the largest fruit-eating birds in Asian tropics. As seed dispersers, they play a pivotal role in the regeneration of. While the unique nesting ecology of hornbills is well known, their roosting ecology is also very fascinating. In Southeast Asia, more than 2,000 plain-pouched hornbills are known to roost in forests near the Thailand-Malaysia border. This photograph is of the wreath hornbill roosts in the Pakhe Tiger Reserve in Northeast India. Reed hornbills are the close relatives of the plain-pouched hornbills. Hornbills have been known to use this particular roost site for decades. My PhD mentor, Dr. Aparajita Dutta, based on field observations, had reported that hornbills prefer roosting in open riverine grassland areas or on cliff faces. What drives the roost choice used by hornbills is not known. Also, while watching them almost every evening, we had simple questions like, "Are the same birds coming and roosting here every evening?" Roost choice could be driven by distribution of food resources. Hornbills could could like to roost near areas with greater fruit availability, or the roost site could be governed by the presence of key locations like its nest, or they might like to roost in areas where the predation and anthropogenic pressures are lower, or they might just prefer certain habitats like the riverine habitat. The photograph of the wreath hornbill that I had just shown was formed along the riverside. Therefore, we try to determine whether the roost choice in hornbills is influenced by the distribution of fruit resources, or riverine habitat, or nest sites. We conducted the study in Pakhe Tiger Reserve in southwest Arunachal Pradesh in northeast India. Pakhe is spread over an area of 862 square kilometers. We tried to trap hornbills in and around the Sijusa area in the southeast part of the Pakhe Tiger Reserve. We spent 17 months trying to trap hornbills using canopy-mounted mist nets. We trapped 17 hornbills, but tagged only five of them. We let go of the female and juvenile birds and the smaller oriental pied hornbill. We used the 55 gram EOBS tags, which weighed less than 3 percent of the hornbill body weight. The tags were programmed to log hornbill locations at 15 minute time intervals during the daytime. Of the five birds that we tagged. Four were great hornbills and one was a reed hornbill. Three birds were breeding birds, while two non-breeding great hornbills were also tagged. The number of days for which usable data was available varied between 19 to 72 days. 
we identified between 3 to 33 different root sites of the different hornbills. Interestingly, there was some evidence that the non-breeding great hornbills had more number of roosts as compared to the breeding hornbills. Non-breeding hornbills range over more than 50 square kilometer of forest, while the breeding hornbills range only about 2 square kilometers of forest. The wreath hornbill, even in the breeding season, ranged over a very large area, which was similar to the non-breeding great hornbills. Yet, it had relatively fewer roost sites compared to the non-breeding great hornbills. This table shows the mean distance between the roost sites on successive nights, mean number of nights a roost site was used, and the mean number of successive nights when the bird used the same roost. This kind of gives us some idea of roost site fidelity. Typically, birds spent about 4-5 to five nights at the same roost before moving to other one. Interestingly, one non-breeding great hornbill had a very high distance between roost sites on successive nights and the, loosed, and the least roost site fidelity. Do hornbills roost near their foraging areas? Here, we have plotted the time of the day on the x-axis and the mean displacement in 15-minute time intervals on the y-axis for the five tagged birds. The breeding great hornbills are in the top row, the non-breeding great hornbills are in the middle row, and the wreath hornbill is at the bottom left. If you notice that every morning and evening before the birds leave or arrive at a roost site, there is significant displacement. Hornbills are known to forage early in the morning and late in the evenings before they come to their roost sites. Such large displacement indicates that the birds are moving either to or away from their foraging areas in the mornings and evenings respectively. This displacement is larger than their daytime displacement, clearly indicating that the birds are unlikely roosting near their foraging areas. Do hornbills roost near riverine areas? Here on the x-axis are the five individual birds. The wreath hornbill is on the extreme right shown in the lighter grey colour. On the y-axis, the distance of the roost to the river is shown in meters. What you clearly see is that the great hornbills individuals that we are tagged did not particularly roost near the riverside. They might do so occasionally. On the other hand, the wreath hornbill consistently roosted near the riverside. The same is evident from the Google Earth image shown on the left where the roost locations are shown in red and yellow points. Most of the roost locations are near the river. The yellow pins with a star are the most used roost sites. If you remember the picture from the beginning of the roost site or the wreath hornbill, this is the location of that particular roost site. Do hornbills roost near their nests? Given the unique breeding biology of hornbills, where the parent birds invest so much in rearing a single chick, it is possible that male birds might roost near the nest. Here on the x-axis are the three breeding hornbills. On the y-axis, we have plotted the distance of the roost to the nest in meters. The box on the extreme right is that of the wreath hornbill in lighter grey. You can see that hornbills on average roost more than 400 meters away from their nest. Here in the Google map image, the nest, the nest of the wreath hornbill is at the location within the red circle. You can see that most of the roost locations are away from the nest. So what do we know about the roosting ecology of hornbills? We still know very little. What we know is that the roost sites are not likely influenced by the nests and fruit rich areas. Wreath hornbill did prefer roosting near the river, the reasons for which need to be determined in future studies. Now let's move on to understanding the ecological role of hornbill. More than 90% of hornbill diet is fruits. Aparajita's research demonstrated that hornbills do not damage the seeds, may they be large or small. For many species, the gut treatment of hornbills actually enhances their germination. Aparajita also found that hornbills disperse a lot of seeds under the roost and the nest sites. At nest sites, the females keep regurgitating the seeds that accumulate under the nest. This results in clumped dispersal of seeds. What she found is that the clumped dispersal of seeds under nest and roost sites does not necessarily enhance the regeneration of plants. Seeds and saplings here face significant pressures from seed predators, unfavorable climate and herbivores. Respect. During my PhD, I focused on the number of seeds dispersed by hornbills on forest floor away from their nests or roosts. 
I found that hornbills could be scatter dispersing seeds on average up to 3000 seeds per day per square kilometer and these are only the large seeds that I am talking about. These seeds are scatter dispersed in the forest during the day in numbers between 1 to 2 seeds per plot. Additionally, we were not aware how far are the seeds dispersed by hornbills. With increasing forest fragmentation and climate change, hornbills can potentially play a pivotal role in connecting plant subpopulations by moving seeds between the different subpopulations. They can also help plants in upward movement with increasing temperatures. This can only be achieved if hornbills are found to move seeds at larger distances. Long range seed dispersers are a rarity and we wanted to figure out if hornbills are one of them. Therefore, we asked the following questions. What are the seed dispersal distances of hornbills? What proportion of seeds are dispersed at the nest and the roost side? While we had the movement data at 15 minute time interval, which is about the time that the hornbills spend on fruiting trees, we also needed gut retention time data to determine the seed dispersal distances of hornbills. Ushma and Akanksha diligently collected this data from captive birds in Nagaland Zoo. This table shows the median gut retention times for five large seeded plants and you can see that the gut retention times are between 85 to 155 minutes. We use this gut retention time data, the final scale movement data and the frugivore activity pattern data to generate the seed dispersal kernels. This box and whisker, whisker plot shows the median seed dispersal distances for the breeding and non-breeding great hornbills. The median dispersal distances are around 250 to 300 meters. Interestingly, the non-breeding birds which range over larger distances have a long tail where they occasionally disperse seeds up to 13 kilometers from the parent tree. The breeding wreath hornbill had the median dispersal distance of more than 1 km and was also occasionally dispersing seeds beyond 10 km from the parent tree. This is the location heat map for one of the great hornbills. The area to the north and the west of the river is, belongs to the Pake and Namiri Tiger Reserve, while area to the east and south of the river is all reserve forests. You can see that the great hornbill has moved outside the protected area on multiple occasions. Similar pattern can be seen in the case of wreath hornbills. It is likely that hornbills are moving seeds between protected area and the adjoining degraded forests. This particular figure shows the distance classes from the parent fruiting tree on x-axis and the probability of seed arrival in the different distance class intervals on the y-axis. You can see that the probability of seed arrival under the parent tree is very very low. The probability of seed arrival under non-nest sites is shown in light grey while at the nest sites is shown in black within the bar. This is the data shown for two of the five hornbills. We found similar patterns for other individuals. You can see that the relative proportion of seeds dispersed at nest sites is a tiny fraction of seeds that are being dispersed. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we can conclude that male hornbills are mostly dispersing the seeds in the forest away from the trees. This stacked bar plot shows the relative proportion of seeds that are dispersed at roost sites in lighter grey and non-roost sites in darker grey. Again, you can see that less than 10% of seeds are dispersed at the roost site. So this allowed us to conclude that only a small fraction of seeds are dispersed by male hornbills at unfavorable sites, that is the nests and the roosts. This and our other studies demonstrate that most seeds are scattered dispersed on the forest floor by hornbills, which are likely to be favorable sites for seed germination. This also shows that, plant, that hornbills play a key role in seed dispersal by also demonstrating large long distance seed dispersal. We spent 17 months trying to catch hornbills. We managed to trap only on 15 of those days. The movement data was among the first of its kind for these species and has given some novel insights into Asian hornbill ecology. However, we learned tremendously more about hornbills on the days we failed to catch them. That fortunately or unfortunately has not been captured in papers yet but has helped us plan future studies. Most importantly, we made friendships while we were devising plans to trap these words. Unfortunately, we have lost two of the main 
team members who played a key role in the study. Tully and Kumar are no longer with us. Here on the right is a picture of Tully with a great hornbill. Tully and Kumar, this work is dedicated to their fellowship and their love for hornbills. It was a quite a challenging project. It took us almost two and a half years for the grant to materialize. It took us one more year for the research permissions from the Forest Department, NTCA and Ministry of Environment for, and Forests to come through. It was seven, 17 months of fieldwork, but we got data for five birds. Journals were not happy. They want larger sample sizes. But the challenges in the field to catch the smart birds are immense. Very, very difficult to trap these birds in Northeast. This was a high voltage work. We were tensed when we didn't trap birds because we were worried we are not getting any data. When we had them in our hands, it was a tense experience given holding such large magnificent birds. And after we released them, on occasions when we could not find them for days, we were also tense days when we thought that whether we had lost those birds. So all of it, however, in retrospect, was a great learning experience. We learned so much more about hornbill ecology in the times that we spent in field, watching and trying to tap, trap them and tag them. All the data that I have just presented is all publicly available, including the movement data, the gut retention time data and other data. This work is possible because we got immense support from the Thailand Hornbill project team. They taught us more than trapping and tagging hornbills. We are immensely grateful to them. We are grateful to SERB for the grant to Dr. Aprajita that supported this work. We had a fantastic field team of local field assistants, researchers and volunteers. I am proud to say that three of the researchers who worked with us have gone ahead and carved a career for themselves in the field of movement ecology. Akanksha, Ushma and Mahalisri. We got a lot of support from our colleagues and friends for, to whom we are immensely grateful. I would like to thank you all for your patience and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks a lot. Fantastic, Rohit. So somehow we see like hornbill groups of rubigos ornithologists yeah. have like trumped the others like this Somehow is such a fantastic set of work and, from, and I guess like his last slide already displayed the key people to contact so if we have budding ornithologists who want to learn about like taking small steps so telemetry is just a tool so before we get fascinated about it I guess multiple talks about the same set of study must have allowed you to percolate how much of effort goes in so don't get fooled by the tool is what uh, Rohit was trying to say you through like various stages. So Rohit, we have a single question or we have another question. We'll take them. Nishant has asked an interesting questions about the sociality of hornbills. At times we see them hopping in certain groups and he wants to understand how frequently do they fly together or like do they showcase fidelity to roosting or feeding sites? So do we have such information with you? Thanks. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Thanks a lot, Ashant, for that. Um, so let me break this down into multiple questions that are there. Uh, one is about the sociality. So for example, the wreath hornbills and several other uh, righty seros hornbills are known to roost in large flocks. And therefore, they are very, very social. And uh, you know, similar patterns you also see for the great hornbills and occasionally for other hornbill species as well. So they are definitely a lot uh, social, especially when they're roosting. And uh, regarding their fidelity to foraging trees, yes, we have seen patterns where, for example, in the breeding season, uh, these are great hornbills at smaller home ranges, and they would have a few trees within their home range, which they would frequently visit, and they would feed from there. So they also show some foraging site fidelity. In the, in the unlike the great hornbill, the reed hornbill was even more interesting. You know, the great hornbill nest and the reed hornbill nest, in fact, was within few hundred meters from each other, and we tagged these birds at around the same time. The first great hornbill and the first reed hornbill that we tagged. 
And interestingly, while the Great Hornbill was uh, ranging over only an area of two square kilometers, the Reed Hornbill was in fact traveling over an area, ranging over an area of about 50 square kilometers. It was going outside Pake Raiga Reserve in the distant reserve forests. It was also going into other parts of Pake and further parts of Namiri as well. So it was really, you know, um, ranging over a much larger distance. So technically, I would think that, you know, if you compare it with the Great Hornbill, the fruit resources, the Great Hornbill was able to uh, nest successfully there. And the wheat hornbill should have also been able to find fruits in the close vicinity, but it really ranged over large areas. Now, why they do this is something that we still need to unravel. There are probably evolutionary and ecological factors that drive uh, these ranging patterns and that need to be explored in future studies. But uh, yes, even uh, they do show some fidelity for foraging sites. They do show some fidelity for the roost sites. You notice that the great wheat hornbill was ranging over large areas. Yet it had, was roosting only in about 10 different sites, out of which two sites it particularly preferred to roost. And it was making large distance uh, displacements to and fro from uh, its foraging sites to the roost sites. So there is evidence for some site fidelity in, in the hotbills. All right. Thank you, Dr. Nani Vadekar. That was a really great session. Um, Next, the, the remaining questions will be answered on Discord since uh, the questions would be visible by both uh, attendees and speakers at a later time as well. Uh, now we will move on to the next presenter, also the final presenter for our morning session, uh, Mr. Siravit Subane. Uh, he is pursuing a doctor, his doctorate of veterinary medicine degree at the Cassetart Laboratory of Raptor Research and Conservation Medicine in Thailand. He has worked on raptors for a few years now, and the title of his talk is Migratory Patterns of Black Kite Taxa in Thailand. On to you, Dr. Subane. Good afternoon, all the participants. My name is Sirevi Subane, the presenter of the topic Migration Patterns of Black Kite Midwest Migrants Taxa in Thailand. Mewas migrants or black kite is a medium-sized diurnal raptor in Thailand. There are two taxa, including Mewas migrants govinta and Mewas migrant lineatus. The former has bright yellow color on sear and tarsus, while the latter, which can be alternatively called black ear kite, has its pale gray on deck sear and tarsus. On the right picture is a Midwest migrant lineatus and on the left side is Midwest migrant govintas. Currently, Midwest migrant govinta is classified as a sedentary breeding resident, while the Midwest migrant lineatus is classified as a winter visitor spending non-breeding months in Thailand. Based on the observations, the massive paddies and rice field in Pakpapli district, Nakhonayok province, central Thailand, was selected as a researching site. This area contains breeding sites for Govinta kais, and there are many eucalyptus plantations which were useful night roosting site for 2,000 plus black ear kites. The method we used to track black kite movement, including GPS GSM tag on three nestlings and two adult male breeders of Govinta kite, while an adult female black ear kite was caught from the night roosting area. One of the nestlings on the left picture, an adult breeder going to cat on the right, were tagged with GPS GSM locker on their back individually. Each tag weighs 20 to 20 grams and the total weight of tagging lockers must less than 5% of kite's body weight in kilograms. Here is the map showing the post fledging movement of the first target going kite at the age of nestling 
in April 2020, named Naka, had begun its journey on 16 May in the same year. Naka flew westward, settling in Yangon, Myanmar, on 21st May and passing through Bangladesh. Then he had arrived Jaipur, Rajasthan, Northwest India, and spent non-breeding month visit for three months. In September in the same year, Naka moved southward to Tamil Nadu and followed the coast of Bay of Bengal tending eastward to Thailand and completed its migration loop at Nato site in Pakli Paddies with a total distance of 16,920 kilometers in May 2021. After the Naka had come back to Thailand, we continued tracking more Govinta kites including uh, Tewa, the yellow line, designated as number R226, Rakpli, the blue line, designated as R209, Ram, the green line, designated as R210, and Laksman, designated as the pink line. R85. This uh, black kite go, uh, subspecies Govinta uh, had begun their journey similar to the Naka flyway westward to India. Based on GPS fixes available, juvenile Govinta black kite hatched in Thailand traveled longer distance to India than adult kite. In November 2021, we received the GPS signal of an adult male Govinta named Tewa, and we found its nest near the Bakri Patties, and also the nest repairing behavior while he fly to catch the branch and take it back to its nest. On Mewas migrants lineatus, or black-eared kite, an adult female were caught at the night roosting area named Sida. In contrary to black kite Govinta, Sida left Thailand in April 2021 and reached the summering site near Lena River in Yakut, Siberia, in early May 2021. After that, in August in the same year, Sida launched her southbound migration and reached Bakpi Pradesh on 8th November, completing approximately 12,000 kilometers of latitudinal migration between Siberia and Thailand. Based on GPS signal, Sida spent her time in Siberia, so we were thankful to the collaboration of our Russian colleagues to two photos of Sida and its present was confirmed on 16th June 2021. In conclusion, the movement pattern of the four tagged kites indicate that black kite subspecies Govinta in Thailand is a breeding visitor, not a year-round resident as previously thought. This study provides the first substantial evidence that black kite subspecies Govinta in Thailand is a migratory. While the migration of black eared kite was found that they are from Siberia as a boreal migration in north to south direction. Thank you for your attention. If anyone has a question, please feel free to ask. Thank you.
Am I audible? Am I audible? Great. We have few questions for you, Sarava. Yes. Yes, please. So, Praveen has like opened the Pandora box, and like in a way, Black Kites opened a Pandora box of questions. As ornithologists tend to get confident about the movement status or like migratory or non-migratory status, so he yes. wants to understand. Do you think there may be like other set of resident raptors or like presumably resident raptors in your part of the world as well? Although we are not very far from each other. Uh, pardon for the question again, please. So I'll repeat the question for you. What he meant was that people used to take Govinda subspecies of black kite as a resident raptor, right? That they were yeah. not the ones moving. Till like thousands of kilometers, which your data is showcasing. So, because your laboratory with Dr. Chayan is like doing enormous work on other raptor species as well, you'll be happy to learn if you have found like something similar about other raptors as well. Ah, uh, well, um, for 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 these uh, circumstances, um, I think that there there are some. The, at the first time, it's the mystery of the black guy because I'm, I'm one of the citizens of Nakhonayok and Park Pri district. That I usually see this type of kite always in the paddies. But in the middle of the year, some of the villagers told me that there has, uh, they, they cannot observe the such species of this kite. And we start to track them with the GPS uh, lockers. So this technology help us to reveal the mystery of the nature. And I think there, there should have some species uh, have a, a minor migration and in the, in the land, land migration from east to west also. No, Nishant, are you still with us? Take it out, Nishant, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Sorry. Can anybody else can you hear us? Yes, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, please go on. Mm -hmm. So, Sorry. just... Anybody else can you hear us? Yes, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, please go on. Mm -hmm. So, Sorry. just yes. yes, we can hear you. Yeah, please go on. So, I'm not sure where the feedback is from. You please mute yourself. Uh, and either Nish Nika Nishant or Nikita, can you please unmute or where the feedback is from? Yes, I think it will stop now. Please go on. Yeah. Am I audible? Am I audible? 
Yes, we can hear you, Nishant, but there is still a little bit of feedback. May I audible? May I audible? Yes, uh, I, I can. Yes, Nishant. Am I audible now? Yes. Thanks. Sorry for the confusion and because of the technical glitch. I guess most of the questions shooted to Siravit are like, like exploring certain kind of conformity and being another set of black kite researcher from like with a study set in Delhi, we can very well say that we are still at the nascent stage. So while for 150 or 200 years, we were considering this subspecies to be Govinda, it is quite not possible for us, even like for either of the research groups, but Saravit, can you add with certain confirmation or like what are the directions which you guys are exploring? So there are multiple questions which are trying to explore these differences. So is there a plan already in place to explore the differences in between the resident and migratory birds, both from understanding it through telemetry or other methods? Nishant, he has answered your query, I guess, in chat box. Yeah, in the chat box. I will read that out for people. So Chaya, who is colleague of Seravit, has responded that, yes, we check the coordinates and GPS. And almost all adult males spend hunting time in big cities, while the juvenile kites spend time in carcass dumps, like the one which is in the state of Rajasthan in, on, in the western end of India. The place is called Jodbead, which has like massive carcass dumping sites. So I guess we will have like some issues to solve in terms of multiple research groups working on black kites because uh, this sets the tone for having telemetry symposiums like this, like the one which you're having, wherein birds starting from Thailand transect the country left, like not only from east to west, but also from north and southern distances. And having such kind of conversations will allow us to come up with better questions for which we use this tool. Okay. So we will break for lunch now, and I will request people to like come back with more set of questions towards the end of our second session, which will which will have a panel discussion. We have a fantastic set of panelists, and I'll be moderating your questions through them. I've already collected certain questions from my end. And we will also entertain questions like what kind of tags to choose? Why do we have like certain weight categories? What are the various ways into which certain type of harnesses are used for specific species? And even what kind of technology do we have for various weight categories and birds showcasing different behaviors. For instance, birds which are like living in tree burrows as opposed to the birds which open nest in open. So all these kind of questions would be entertained of course the panel discussion. So please pour them in on the Discord channel for the panel discussion. Before that, we have another set of fantastic discussions dominated by discussions and raptors. So over and out and happy for your patience through multiple glitches. Thanks a lot. Over to the main organizers, if they have to share anything. Thanks, Sashant. That's all for now. We'll meet you all at 2 p.m. again. Okay, we break for lunch then. Thank you, everybody. See you across the lunch.